Ronnie Kosher live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt of Pranakash Productions, and today, believe it or not, we are talking with Nami Melamod. But before we get into it, um, folks, if you like this video, please give us a like. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Press like, press subscribe down there. And then also, leave a comment. We'd love to have these little conversations happening down there in the comment area. And YouTube loves it when we do that. And then... Suppose this is like your favorite video of all, and it should be because of the person we're talking to today, then share far and wide on your platform of choice, social media platform of choice, I should say. So, okay, enough of that. So we have Nami Milamad, and if you don't know who Nami Milamad is, shame on you for shame, okay? <laughs> You're giving me way too much credit. <laughs> uh, well, hold on, though, because she has a pretty <laughs> impressive thing on her resume, which is the person who does the background music for Star Trek Strange New Worlds, like the best Star Trek show that's been around for in the last 50 years. Okay. <laughs> and then also Star Trek Prodigy, which is a pretty good kids show. Actually, it has amazing visual effects, and the, the music is totally top-notch. And... um so on. <laughs> so uh, this, and also the other thing I'm going to point out right at the beginning, folks, is that for whatever reason, the classical music world and the composing world is just loaded with men. Like almost everybody's a guy, and then uh, a woman in this field, I don't know why, is a rarity. So to have somebody, and then you're also quite young, like you're like in your 30s, right? Yeah, 33. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm over 50. So that, anybody younger than 40 to me is a kid. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're still a kid. <laughs> this kid, this bright kid here is like killing it in the Star Trek world. So um, <clears throat> also, la croix for that dry throat, <laughs> that itchy throat, that scratchy thing in the back. A little bit of bubbly will go a long way. Oh, it does. I agree. <laughs> I okay, so I'm going to let you talk, I promise. <laughs> I'm just really excited to have, I've been really looking forward to this. So, but okay, so folks, so number one, she's she's the person who does all the background music for, again, Strange New Worlds is completely killing it. Every single episode has been excellent, you know. So to be associated with that show, even if you're no good, would be a great thing. But the thing is, is that uh, your music is great. It's super interesting. I mean, I love it. I love all the cues you do. And there, everyone has, has its own unique thing. It has a totally, it has its own like little universe associated with it. And it's just so well done. So, and also folks, in case you don't know, I played the cello somewhere back there. Well, here's the cello bow. Cool. Also play violin. I'm also a composer. I just did a cello concerto this weekend. I'm a conductor. I'm like the president of an orchestra, all this stuff. So I'm, like when I'm telling you that she's good, she's good. She's super good. So her music is really, I love it, you know? So there we go. <laughs> Tell wow. us a little about yourself. This was a <laughs> I don't, like, now I have to like... Uh... <laughs> Keep that tender. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, all of this is true. I'm, I'm very fortunate to. It is true. See, she is good. She said she's good. Well, yeah, Sorry. I know I'm good. I'm very good at my job. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, too. It took a while to, to become good. Uh, I will say that I, I have been at it for like 17 years now. <laughs> 17. Yeah, with with some breaks here and there. Um, oh wow. I'm, I'm from Israel, so uh, there's <clears throat> all the military service stuff, which. You know, it was two years of not doing a lot of music. It was mainly doing, you know, playing guitar and, and doing my military job. Um, and then... Wait, wait a minute. So what was your military job? I was an interviewer, actually. Uh, so oh. my job was what you're doing now. Um, oh. <laughs> I, uh, I would talk to uh, candidates uh, for, for service and, you know, ask them about their lives and their 
um, you know, their motivation and uh, like all, all sorts of like, uh, you know, personality stuff to see uh, where they would fit best okay. um, and what, you know, where they would also benefit, uh, you know, to be in. Um, so it was but very- they didn't have a choice, right? They were automatically signed up, right? Uh, well, yeah, it's mandatory service. Uh, okay. Boys and girls. Um, but there are exceptions and there, there are, uh, cases where, um, you know, either you're exempt because of your, uh, religious status or you're pregnant or you're married or you're, uh, mentally, uh, you know, not, not able to serve like all, all sorts of, uh, or physically not able to serve. Like there, okay. there are exceptions. <clears throat> um, and there are also moral exceptions too, which is very interesting, um, it's a whole hmm. other discussion. Uh, discussion. So, That's interesting because, yeah. like, when they, uh, I mean, they, they haven't drafted people in the U.S. forever, but I don't remember people getting a pass if they were married. Well, this is only for, uh, for ladies. Uh, okay. It, it, this is very, yeah, I think it's an older uh, way to look at it. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's if, if you're um, married, usually you'll be exempt. And most of those married girls will actually serve in, in a civilian system um, and not in the military. Okay. So, um, but they'll do something that might support the military type of a thing or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not always. Like sometimes <clears throat> it'll be like a, like a, like a medical uh, field, like, you know, support a hospital, support a clinic. Um, or, or social services uh, or, or schools or stuff like that. Um, so there, there's also, I mean, I, I think it is, is, it is kind of a good idea for a society that, that people need to contribute some time, uh, you know, in order to do something for the greater good. Um, but I was uh, in the Air Force. You were in the Air Force? Really? Six years. That's so cool. Reserves. Was Technically job? the guard. Okay. It was a com I was a computer guy. Super cool, though. Yeah. So you totally understand that. Like, yeah, I like it. it. It really matures people, too. Like, when I came mm. to the U.S., I was already 25, I think. Okay. Um, and, like, you know, compared with 25-year-olds, <laughs> I think I was a little more mature. Uh, just having growing up in, in a place where it's, you know, you kind of, it's, it's uh, it gets you more mature when you grow up in the Middle East. <laughs> okay. You said you were 32, right? 33. So yeah. you were born in 1999? I'll take 32, though. I'll totally take, take 30. Uh, I was born in 1888. Uh, in what? In 1988, <laughs> December. 19, oh, oh, I did the math wrong. 88. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I can I relate to that. I'll take your math. I think, that was the, I think that was the year when they came out with the whole deal with cold fusion. Uh, remember yes. I don't suppose you remember that. I, I, heard, I have heard fusion music, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, I'm not talking about cold fusion, the software. I'm talking about cold fusion, the, the, the uh, phenomenon. There was oh. this, there were these two Fleischmann and Martin, I think were their names, these two scientists that had claimed they'd figured out a way to have, make fusion happen without having to have millions of degrees of temperature and, oh, and huge wow. amounts of pressure and stuff and... I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, that is very cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's still I, controversial. There's some people that still, be, a lot of scientists still believe in it. A, a, a whole bunch of other scientists think it's all crap. But, well, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, I think there's something to it because I researched it for a while. And um, I don't think it's actually fusion. It's some other weird thing that's going on that, that causes... Um, a release of energy mm. but anyways yeah see like i said we always i or i warned net oh shoot now i'm not saying it right nami nami yes. Yes. i warned nami that we tend to go on tangents so <laughs> we haven't even started talking about music yet um yeah. oh so you said so you've been doing it for 17 years so are you been doing music for 17 years or you've been doing yeah. film scores for 17 uh, I've years been doing, i've been music Sorry. Oh, I've been doing music for much longer than that um, because I started as a, a player. I was playing piano um, and uh, at oboe at some point. <laughs> oh, I thought you played clarinet. Uh, I, I play a little bit of clarinet. Like this is a oh. recent addition uh, in the past few years. But um, Okay, because oboe is way harder. 
It was really hard. I, yeah. I break the reeds all the time. Um, and uh, those reeds are very delicate and uh -huh. they're very expensive. And you don't, uh, you don't like to use those synthetic ones? Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what I liked because it was when I was 12 years old. So, you know, okay. it's a long time ago. Um, okay. And I ended up picking up a flute because it doesn't break. Uh, and also it fit my personality better, I think, because because that was like this, you know? You're yeah, I actually took it. I took a double reads class at the University of Washington oh, cool. and they started us out in bassoon, which was super fun. I loved it. And I like I even got where I could play some Bach minuets by the time halfway through the quarter. Oh, cool. And then after that, we switched to oboe and I was like, I hate this. I want to go back to bassoon. <laughs> Because bassoon had all these low notes and everything that were super satisfying, and it was pretty easy to get a sound. It didn't have this super tight embouchure, you know. And so, like when I first tried to play oboe, I thought I was gonna have a stroke. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot, especially yeah. for kids. Like, um, so yeah, flute is definitely um, easier. But I never tried bassoon, and now I want to try. Like, you oh, you should! You'd oh, love it. <laughs> I guarantee you'd love it, especially as a composer. I love orchestra. I love using the bassoons in the orchestra. Uh, yeah. Ah, perfect, perfect segue. <laughs> I did appreciate the use of bassoon in our latest Strange New Worlds episode, the fantasy one, where we're we're oh, in yeah. the story. There was a. Um, okay, so I really love that. I love that there was a solo bassoon part that I thought was really cool. Well, thank you. And it was also a part, I mean, it was part of that lick that was, it was kind of a um, sort of a renaissance sort of deal. Mm -hmm. It had bassoons. I think bassoon, something like a bassoon might have been around back then. Anyway, yeah, I really liked it. So now here's my question. When you do all these, when you do all these licks, um, do you, how much of the orchestration is yours? Like, do you fully score it out or do you just kind of give a vague idea and have somebody else do the final orchestration for you? Right, so on Strange New World, um, I, I mean, actually, um, well, probably everything I do. Okay. Um, I tend to write, like, uh, to, to put out, like, so my template on, I, I work on Q, in Cubase. Uh, my template has about 600 channels. <laughs> so I do have every instrument um, separated. Um, so it depends on time. Um, on Strange New Worlds and, and, the, and, the, and Prodigy, um, I normally do have the time to put out like um, orchestration on my own. Um, so oh, I, that's, okay. that's how I write. Like I, I write. Write on the score. I, I, Conductor I score. Sorry? So like you're writing, like. Mahler, for example, would write a piano score. Yeah. So and then I, later he would he goes, score it out in a full conductor score. But yeah, that is like, a smart way to do it. But yeah, I am. You don't do I'm, that. I don't do that. Uh, I actually I like going by by colors. So I, I tend to, like if I if I actually try it on the instruments, you know, obviously I use MIDI. Mm -hmm. um, but when I try it, it actually inspires other ideas that are a, a, a color thing. Um, OK. So with. With that in mind, um, you know, when I write, let's say for trumpets or um, uh, horns, mm -hmm. um, it, it, I will not separate out which who's doing what. So let's, for example, we have three horns on Strange New Worlds. Mm -hmm. um, they will all be three? together. Why don't you have four? Uh, well, budget. <laughs> you can't afford a fourth horn player? Uh, I have 37 musicians, so I, I need to pick up um exactly the, the right balance that will provide the orchestra okay. bigger than it is how many trombones do you guys have uh three okay and a tuba right of course we don't have a tuba no tuba wait a second you gotta have a tuba you're, there is no budget uh there was no i mean on season one there was no okay budget. Let's but say the thing is is uh, you, what you could do is you could use real orchestra and then you could just use a really good sample for the added instruments or you write really well uh, and figure it out, because uh, oftentimes a bass trombone uh, would, comp you know, uh, compensate for the lack of a tuba. That's true. Um, yeah. And then if you add, let's say you're adding a bass, like a, you know, the basses with it, and a, like a contrabassoon and mm -hmm. a contrabass clarinet, and, um, and hold you on, supplement with the, the with the timpani, then you get a big sound. 
does it and maybe even add like a low piano right okay uno a momento big, big boom and you know and then you know people will think you have a tuba but you don't have a tuba okay <laughs> so you're telling me you guys have a contra bassoon but you don't have a tuba no i will i will say uh we have one bassoon player and he oh. um or she will bring other instruments you know they, she can play contra and they will switch if needed um so yeah one bassoon? You're supposed to have two bassoons. Well, this is, <laughs> this is like small, a pit orchestra. This is a small orchestra. Okay. I, you know, uh, you have a certain budget and you have to. Okay. This How is many violins? Boring. Uh, I think we have like 12. No, I'm not sure. I need to. Let me check. Um, that That's reasonable. I know a lot of, a lot of um, theater orchestras have actually a pretty small string section. Yeah, we have a small string show. Okay. So but it actually small sounds small. better That's because right. if they're good players, then it sounds a lot tighter and it's got more edge to it and it actually sounds yeah. better. Than yeah, like that's true. And the original um, the original Star Trek orchestra for the original series was was even smaller than this. So. Well, it didn't even have strings in it. That Most of it was like wind ensemble stuff. Uh, yeah. You know? they, did, they did have a lot of low strings, like kind of what, yeah. like what we do. We have four violas, four celli, and three basses. And 12 oh, that's violins. my basis. So, okay. So that would be, you know, there, it's a very bassy orchestra in comparison to the violin. Okay. Um, and this is, you know, this this was, you know, I, I consulted with uh, with my orchestrator uh, Jeff Kricka, and then Dennis Sands, um, who's the engineer, um, one of the engineers, but he's like, <laughs> you know, he's very known. Um, right. And and, uh, and he know he you know they that's that's what we came to. Uh, to think that like this this ensemble will bring us the biggest sound. Okay. Then, a lot of stuff are in the box. Um, you know, still computer sounds. Um, I was so gonna say so like so you have real and then you add some of the libraries too to, yes. to expand yeah. it. So yeah. we have okay. only strings, brass, and winds. Everything else that you're hearing, so whether it's timpani, percussions, uh, you know, um, let's just snare cymbals, all of that hmm. stuff. Um, vibraphone, uh, marimba, celesta, glock, mm. all of that. Um, piano is in the box. Um, huh. Even the timpani, box. wow. Because it's yeah. kind of hard to get a good timpani sound out of a fake uh, thing. Yeah, well, this is a Cine samples. Um, mm. Almost everything I, I use is Cine samples. It's, you know, I'm, t I'm telling you, I'm not a, a sophisticated. Uh, Can it do decent rolls? That's one of the things with timpani is some of the samples, you do a timpani roll and it sounds really stupid. Yeah. It doesn't uh, have the rumble that it's supposed to have. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I really recommend the Cine Samples ones. It's it's Sign Perk, it's called the library. Okay. Um, and it's it's very good. And it was recorded by Dennis Sands, who is our engineer. So he cool. knows how to blend it well. Um well I then, happen to know a really good timpani player if you ever need one. Well, I wish I <laughs> had the budget for that, but with timpani, what what happens in, in Hollywood is that you also have to pay for cartridge, right? You have to pay right. for it to be delivered. Oh, one thing I will say. Or you could buy a set of timpani and just keep them there in the studio. Well, that that is a thought that they should take seriously. Yes, uh, I agree. <laughs> um, they have a piano there, so there you go. Um, but uh, yeah. And Grand? That I forgot. Yeah. But exactly. what kind of piano? Oh, my God. Uh, it's Tane Williams. Uh, and it's one of the best, maybe even the best I have ever played. Like, it's oh, so, okay. it's so okay. nice. Um, but yeah, sometimes we have live harp. Uh, so that adds a lot, actually. There's you got to have harp. Well, there, there, you're, there you're paying for portage. <laughs> <laughs> so I know uh, that one, too. I mean, in the Seattle area, I'm pretty sure the going right for a harpist is somewhere between $150 and $200 a service. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. So when you guys have musicians, you just pay them per service type of thing, just a flat rate? Um, well, it's uh, there's union rules. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure how much they're paid because there's different contracts for every TV show like right. or, or streamers like there or movies and there's all sorts of tiers. Yeah. Um, I think they're, again, I'm not sure on this, so I, I don't know if I should be quoted, but I think it's around uh, 150 or 200 or 300, like- Per service. Uh, no, per, per hour. Oh and oh wow, that's good. Yeah, it's 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 a you know. Okay, that's really good. Everything. Like they get pension, um, and uh, like you know all, all the stuff. Like this is this is a union thing, so you know. Okay. 
and and CBS is always recording. Um, do you find yourself once you've scored something out and you then you send it to your orchestrator to polish it a little bit and then do you ever find yourself in the studio listen watching them pre rehearse it? Um, we don't have time for rehearsals really. <laughs> they just sight read it. Yeah, they sight read it, and that's that's yeah. part of, of you know the the, the glory of of yeah. watching. In the Hollywood orchestra, they just so you have to be really good. Uh, okay, well, the orchestrator, the person who orchestrates, really has to know what they're doing then. And then, yeah. so, do oh, you have him kick stuff back to you and say, "Sorry, this is too hard. We can't do it. You got to rewrite it." No, he's. he's or would he be the one who rewrites it? No, no, he's a pro. Uh, I, I should I should mention that there's also Tracy Turnbull who's been helping out a lot. So sometimes they they uh, you know, especially when there's no time, they they would divide things between them. Okay. Um, but as I was starting to say earlier, um, right. so often the the uh, um, the the job of the orchestrator uh, would be to take those, let's say, three trump three trumpets that are written on the same line and three horns. And sometimes I would, you know, write a, a four chord note, and so he mm. will or she will have to figure out, you know, which horn is playing what and which note is going to someone else or out of the. You know, so have that you happen. any uh, Wagner tuba is in the back closet? Oh man, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish. Like that would have been incredible. But no. <laughs> yeah, sometimes a horn player or a trombone player has one, and they know how to play it. Oh man. So yeah. Well, do you have it? I mean, you have a lot of things in your closet. No, <laughs> well, I've got. I mean, I'm a string player, but basically, so. But I do. I mean. Since I'm a composer right, and I play in a bunch of different orchestras, I do hang out with all the different wind players to to get used to them. And oh, cool. I actually also um, ask them to tell me if, if there's parts that didn't work to tell me why and stuff like that. Like I just wrote some, I just, I have really good horns in our orchestra. Our chamber orchestra has a really good horn section. So I tend to write pretty hard stuff for them that I know they can play it. <laughs> Like this last piece we just did, they're like, did you really have to write that high B right there? And I was like, you guys can do it. And they're like, well. <laughs> and actually, they did do it at the concert. Oh, that's so, so cool. And it sounded good. So, high B, that's, that's very high for, for horns. It is. Well, I one of my pieces, I wrote a high C. Oh, God. And, well, what they'll do, if it's too insane, they'll say, Matt, this is crazy. We can't do this. And I'll say, okay, take it down an octave. And to tell you the truth, that's what I told them this time. I said, take it down an octave. And then at the concert, they played it up and it sounded good. Oh, wow. That's so, not a surprise. Yeah, they're really good. Um, yeah, I mean, they're not like Hollywood horn players that are like insanely good. They can play all the super high stuff and it sounds totally beautiful and totally perfect. But, you know, but they're still very good. I will not write a B for a horn, yeah. even in Hollywood. Uh, I mean, I guess they could they could play it several times and then they'll they'll get it right. But uh, yeah, yeah I, to, I just just because we have that time um, time frame that is very short that we you right. Know, work with, um, then I have to make it work instantly, so I I don't take such huge risks. Um, right. The one thing that do does happen is like that I've I've known to be an idiot about. Uh, is because with my woodwind background, I often write like super high woodwinds. Um, yeah. And I imagine them to on be the flutes. angelic and nice. And then I'm like, yeah. oh shit, like this is sounding way too big and way too screechy. Too loud. Yeah. And then we, we end up uh, putting them on the octave. Board. I assume you have a piccolo. I actually don't have a piccolo. Oh, come on. Gee, know, this is I, Star I, Trek. I, I want to get, oh, on That's... Star Trek, we do. Yeah, we do. We do. I thought you were asking me personally if I have. Oh. A Okay. Because <laughs> uh, I'm a flute player. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, uh, we, we have a piccolo, actually. Okay. We have two flutes. Um, so okay. that's the only instrument that has that we have uh, two of. Wait. You only have one clarinet? Sorry, I'm wrong on this. Oh, I'm sorry. You have two confused. oboes, right? I got confused with Star Trek Prodigy. On Prodigy, we have two um, flutes. Here we have uh, one flute, and, and she, um, she will often, like, switch to piccolo. Okay. I'm assuming your oboe player also plays English horn. Oh yeah, yeah of course. Okay. Um, although I've, I think I've only utilized it twice, maybe. Ooh. <laughs> I ooh. like the sound of oboe. Maybe you could do that in season two. You could throw an English horn in there. I, I could, yes. And then could you put Matt Weiss in the credits? English <laughs> horn idea, Matt Weiss. For, for consulting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh boy. Or, well, okay. So this is this is what impresses me the most is the kind of deadlines that you work under because, I mean, it's one thing to write good music, right? Yeah. Like somebody like me, I, like Cello Concerto, I spent ten years on it. Wow. Finally, really? I finally Amazing. performed it two days well. ago. But like, it, you get like hopefully ten days of that per episode, right? Um, a little more, but yes. Okay. Because you know, a lot of times you end up, um, you know, things end up condensed uh, in in a way, <laughs> uh, and and then yeah, I mean, sometimes oh, that's a lot of music. Less. I mean, one one episode of, you know, a show like this is like practically like writing an opera, you it, know, if you had to fill up all the music. Um, yeah, but you have to you have to account for, um, let's say, previous themes or previous textures or previous ideas, previous motifs. Okay. Um, so uh, to me, the bulk of the work is done on the first couple or three, let's say two to three episodes. Um, oh, okay. By then, you know, you know, you know, your characters, you know, your style, you know, your, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of sounds or let's say chord progressions or, or chordal textures that you'll go for. Right. Um, and, and, you know, and then you bring in uh, episodic ideas, right? Because, okay, on this episode, we, we get to right. the comment. And in this episode, we get to the medieval times. And in this episode, uh, we get to like a switcheroo of Spock and, and Pring. That so, was so good. That was great. <laughs> I love that. So, Spock yeah. and Chapring are just totally killing it. Right. They are so good. Exactly. Those two actors are just, I, I was just roaring on that episode. And really? it was funny. It was like sexy. I couldn't believe how that we, we got Spock, who's like, the. I mean, just he raises his eyebrow. They raise the eyebrows at each other and the temperature in the room goes. <laughs> 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 it's just so good. And I was saying, I was talking to Larry Nemechek. I was like, you know, not only are the actors good, the direct, whoever's directing that is really right on too. Yeah. But like they nailed those scenes. It was so well done. I could yeah. watch that scene 10 times in a row and I would still love it. Everything about it. Oh, I agree. A hundred percent. Wow. Um, um, but I was going to say like in the original Star Trek, Star Trek, uh, the original series, TOS, um, they would literally recycle stuff. I mean, they would just take clips of stuff and use it over and over again. But I noticed you don't do that at all. I mean, I mean, well, stuff I, relates, I, I, but I don't I, hear you I, recycling hardly anything. I will tell you a secret. That's not really a secret. Okay. Um, probably all Star Trek shows, except for Prodigy, um, mm -hmm. are recycling. Well, I have to. I mean, you only we're have so much time. It, we're doing it in a way that, that, that like, you know, often you will not notice. Often that there would be a certain change. Sometimes, you know, a layer would be removed or something will be added or, or maybe two, two certain tracks will be on one on top of the other. Or there will be an edit, like, let's say 20 seconds from this queue and then 10 seconds from this queue mm -hmm. and then 50 seconds from that queue. And then it goes to something that is recorded for this particular show. And mm -hmm. then it goes to, some, you know, because and that that happens because of again budgetary limits mm -hmm. because i have three Time. hours with the orchestra even with the best musicians in the world which are let's say la or london whoa 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 so, wait a sec hold on so you have three hours to do one hour worth of music yeah that's, that's it it is impossible holy crap it is impossible you cannot record 50 minutes in in a three-hour window like it's it's just and that's before the and break. that's just the way it is because, you know, the, the union uh, dictates a uh, 10-minute break every right. hour. So mm -hmm. practically you're getting 50 minutes for, you know, 150 minutes, um, which is... I mean, that's like, so you get two takes and that's it. Exactly. So, but sometimes... Wow. Uh, well, the conductor must be really good too. Well, the conductor is the orchestrator usually, so... Okay. Uh, you know, um, they're already familiar with the music. Um, but yeah, so it, it is it is a, a, a thing where That's intense. You know, the, most, the most I could record it was 37 minutes. But so you know, what happens if like your principal oboe calls in sick on that day? Well, we did have that. Um, and uh, this was actually a trombone. And then another trombone uh, was called like, you know, instantly. Uh, and the contractor, she called literally everyone on town. And then luckily there was one person who was available and ready to go. Um, and, uh, and, and good yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it is, you know, sometimes it, it does happen. Like it, it can happen. 
I mean, because when you listen to the music, it's technically perfect. It's everything's in tune. Everything's rhythm, you never hear a blooper. Everything's just lines up perfect. It's also beautifully expressive. And geez, and they're <laughs> just doing that on bit. They're literally doing two tries at that, and that's it. Uh, well, sometimes they do more because sometimes like a cue can be more difficult, um, especially action stuff when you want okay. everything to get on time. And so that relates to what you said earlier that when the strings, when it's a smaller string group, a lot of times mm. it will actually feel tighter because everyone will be together. Right. Um, so that, that actually very, very, it's a right. It's a six point. violins. If you have six really good violins, first violins, that's not great. They can get a huge yeah. sound, sound in a recording yeah. studio. In fact, they can even get a huge sound in a concert hall. Because to tell you the truth, when you got like 10 or 12 or 16 first violins, half of them are, are barely even playing. Really? They're just pretending, you know, <laughs> or they only play the easy stuff. And every time it gets hard, they just kind of go. <laughs> Nobody notices. <laughs> I know I play violin. I do it too. If I'm not the, the only time I play all the notes is when I'm the concert master. <laughs> then, I mean, I'm the guy, basically the concert master is the one that's, whose sound is cutting through and all the hard parts because everybody else is faking it. <laughs> <laughs> They're just providing a little bit of fuzz. Oh my God. <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility there. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. Wow. Oh man. So, um, so do you, have you, do you ever run into the thing where like three hours is up and darn it, we still have like 10 more minutes of music we need? No, because I mean, we, we time it in a way that, you know, all the cues that are meant to be recorded will be recorded. And, and yes, sometimes it means one take or, you know, if, if, if it take is good enough, then we move on. Uh, and then if we have time at the end, we'll come back to fix a mistake or to take another, okay. let's say, Q is 150 bars, let's say. And there was an issue in bar 13 and there was an issue in bar 84. Let's say someone was out of tune or right. someone that was, it got, got in too early or too late or whatever. Then right. we'll go and punch those places just right. that, yeah, part, that, that part and then move on. You know, We will not do a whole new take. In the old days, you would actually literally, it was called a splice, and you would literally cut the tape, the reel-to-reel -reel tape, and scotch tape it together Amazing. to fix that spot. Nowadays, you do it on computers, and it's way easier, and you can... Yeah. I mean, I wish I could see that. Like, that that yeah. would have been so cool to, to see. I that. actually did. I had a reel-to-reel. -reel. Really? Uh, it was like, what year was that? 1995, I think. And I actually did do some splices like that. Wow. Yeah. That is the trick, the thing is, with, with back then, what you have to do if for it to sound good, you have to find empty space to do the splice. Like if you do a hard splice right in the middle of a big wall of sound, you'll hear a yeah. whoosh. Yeah. But nowadays, you can do anything with the computers. Just fade yeah. it in and out, and it'll it all sound fine. Art. Yeah. You still want, we want performances to match. Like, the, the, this is an art of fixing it, fix it in post, what they call it. And that's what your engineer does that part, right? Um, yes. Uh, like, actually, the music editor does it, Matt Decker. The who? Uh, the music editor. Our music editor on the show. Oh, music is, editor. Okay. Yeah, his name is Matt Decker. Okay. And he's, he's saved my ass so many times. I, I definitely owe him. Okay. <laughs> so now I have a new question. So you, you create the cues, and they – so – the episode is already shot and edited before you start doing the cues or how does that work? Yeah. yeah, it's it's usually shot, edited and locked. So it's a locked picture. So they're not planning to change it further. Um, mm. But what is missing is uh, obviously the sound. Because the wow. sound team is working uh, while I'm working. So I'm, you know, hearing temporary effects and temporary um, like music tracks. So there's a reference. Um, oh, the sound effects aren't even in yet? Well, it's temporary sound effects that the editor put in, but the editor is not like a sound person. So it sounds oh, interesting. significantly like a hundred, you know, 95% different uh, when it's get, when the music is ready and the sound is ready. Like it, it's a different feel. Yeah, that's uh, wild. Effects are missing. Uh, visual effects usually are partly done or you see a lot of the animation stuff. or like Sketched out, are, yeah. Uh, and sometimes, occasionally, you will also see green screen or like how the actors are shooting on the stage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's really cool to see that, um, like the, the process of, of how it eventually, you know, get <clears throat> um, and then uh, and, that, and color is missing. So like, you know, color, color correction, you yeah. mean? 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's not a final picture, but it is a final edit. So mm. time-wise, timing is, is what's going to stay. Um, of course, nowadays you can actually s stretch your compressed stuff some and get away with it if you have to. Well, yeah, that's true. That's Matt's job. <laughs> okay. Again, so so you good. they tell you, I need a 20-second cue that kind of does this, that, and the other thing, and then you well, give it to yeah. them, and then are you done with it, or do you do you end up working with them a little bit when they're finally editing into the show? Um, well, yeah, that's that's where Matt comes in because uh, okay. I, I work on on uh, based on what we do in the spotting session, so that is to the lock cut with the timing, um, and so I know okay we need you know to start at this moment and finish at this moment. Um, right. If they make uh, make changes or let's say a certain effect visual effect comes mm -hmm. in in you know later than they planned or earlier than they planned or whatever needs to be matched, mm -hmm. then Matt creates those changes. Or if they ask for like let's end this queue earlier, which happens, mm -hmm. or let's, let's put something in here that was not intended to be, you know, a, a mm -hmm. scene that was intended to be quieter, you know, right. those kind of changes. This is like it, within the, the realm of music editing uh, and not, right. not my. <laughs> Cause they're like, well, that was a cool cue, but unfortunately the trombones are stomping on the dialogue right there. You yeah, know? it does happen. <laughs> I mean, it barely happens, but it does, it, it, you know, there was a, a, actually a recent episode uh, where uh, Uhura was in rotation with Lan, right? Like, which episode was that? Um, wow. Six? No. Yeah, episode six. Um, and and she's in the in the elevator with Pike at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And he's like, have you seen it? You've seen it, right? Yeah, I've seen them all. Um, so he's- he's I've seen them all at least. You know, three times. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> He's making an impression of, of Lon. Uh, and, and that was a really funny, cool moment. And I, I did something funny actually there. Um, and then uh, Henry thought it was a little too much. And so we had to kind of, you know, kind of figure out a way to. Yeah. To, to I mean, you can just fade it out. That's the easy, trip, yeah. easy way to do it. I think that's what they actually end up doing. Um, there's a moment it fades out and then it comes back up. Um, yeah. So Plus, I mean, if you write something that's mostly just a pad, you can also just fade it in and uh, layer across them and you can expand or contract that. Yeah, that's true. It There's was a lot of tricks. Sort of but, so you're not the person who does that. It's it's Matt who does that, that type of stuff. <laughs> well, if, if okay. those changes come in before we record, then I will address them, you know, okay. either with the orchestra on stage or even before that. So it doesn't make it to the final score, you know, the written score. Uh, but if those changes come after, or like, you know, after they get all the other um, elements, like they get mm. the sound, right? Mm -hmm. They get ADR, uh, which is like the dialogue that's been uh, recorded after, you know, mm -hmm. they shot. So oftentimes they'll feel something, they'll feel differently about a certain um, storytelling moment. And sometimes right. the score will be less important or more important. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are changes that happen after the orchestra. Wow, that sounds hard. Like I'm going to approach that from the other perspective. So if I'm the editor and I'm editing all this footage together and I'm putting it, right. making a show out of it, um, I don't have the music yet. Right. That really changes my decisions about what I'm trying to do. Well, you use uh, temporary music. So oftentimes you'll get music from a different movie or a different show. That's kind um, of similar. Yeah. For okay. example, like one of the recent cuts I, I have seen uh, has a temp, uh, temp, we call that temp score okay. uh, or temp track. And it has a temp track from How to Train Your Dragon, which I <laughs> love. I love that score. Um, but it's really, you know, it takes you to a different place, you know, in yeah. your mindset. Cause you're like, oh, this, this, this is totally, you know, this theme is, is um, associated with a certain character and certain story and a, and a certain geographic place in that case. <laughs> so, right. um, but musically, it does work for the scene. So, oftentimes you'll have, um, you know, you have a Giacchino cue and you'll have a John Powell cue and then you'll have a Hans Zimmer 120 <laughs> piece orchestra cue and then they'll take some, you know. And they're saying, you know. Nami, we want you to make something that sounds exactly like that, but isn't exactly that. Right, yeah. Uh, it, it, and you're like, well, I, that's not my style. I don't write like that. Well, I can write like that, but oh. um, actually, I'm very lucky. Like, Henry rarely ever says something like that. You know, it's... Sorry, my lucky. Orville just self-destructed. Oh. <laughs> uh. um, but I, I, I was going to say something. Oh, you have a... You do yeah. watch the Orville, right? 
I do. I do not watch Yarville. Oh, you should watch it. It's really good. <laughs> I know. Uh, I In fear- fact, I say that the reason why Strange New Worlds is as good as it is is because the Orville set the stage for it by bringing back a lot of Star Trek ideals that somehow fell behind the wayside. Well, darn it. It snaps um, together. I don't know what happened. That well, I dropped it the other day and it broke, but I thought I fixed it. Anyway. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Um, so, dang it, I was going to say something really intelligent. Now I forgot what it was. <laughs> <sighs> what well, were we talking said, about? <laughs> I think your sense of car was, was highly intelligent. <laughs> Okay, all right, then let's, since you got a Star Wars shirt, don't you just love the music to The Mandalorian? I do. Oh my God. I was it just, is so good. I was just talking about it, how much I love that that score. It's a great score. And the way that he's, I mean, Ludwig Granson, like utilizing like a feel of Star Trek, of Star Wars music um, with the new, like, you know, the recorder stuff. And then he yeah. takes that theme and does it with the whole orchestra. And I'm, I learned a lot from him. Yeah, and it was just like, I mean, it's set, I mean, it completely, you can't have the Mandalorian without that music because it just sets the whole thing. Oh, this is a cowboy show. Yeah. You know, this is Getty Western. Wild Wild West. Uh, Wild Wild Space West. (laughs) Yeah. It's Um, so good. I I mean, that music plus Baby Yoda is the thing that made Mandalorian totally take off. Yeah. And also the fact, I don't know, I mean, the character itself is is really great. I mean, in person. I will say I, I actually enjoy watching Halo, um, but I, oh. I have an issue with him removing his his uh, you know the his helmet mask. after one episode. Sorry. Yeah, I've only watched two episodes of it. Major spoiler, but he removes his like you know after yeah. during the first episode was it or the second? Like it was so quick, and I'm like, I assume he you know where's all the mystery? Where's the, like? And he just said like that he never. They never take it off. And then, you know, I, I don't know. It's just Why like, did they do that? <laughs> Darn it. Well, then, see, how, okay, here we go. Back to Strange New Worlds. Strange New Worlds, the writers don't make dumb mistakes like that. In fact, they're the opposite. They do some really sophisticated stuff. I agree. You know, like usually in Star Trek, they'll kind of wonk you over the head with it. Or like they'll have two people explain it to you through their dialogue real fast, you know? And, um, but then in, in Strange New Worlds, it's all, it's assumed that everybody who's watching this show um, knows Star Trek and knows a lot of Star Trek. Cause just the way, again, the way that Spock and T'Pring interact is just so good. And all of them actually. I also completely love Nurse Chapel. Oh my God. Uh, me too. She's my sweetheart. Uh, she was, and she, you know, it was really interesting Okay, we're going on a tangent. We only have a half hour. We got to talk mostly music, I think. But I, the thing I really was interesting about the the fairy tale episode was all the actors got to play a completely different character, right? Yes. Than their usual character. That was amazing. Except <laughs> Spock, he still played Spock. Yeah. He, did pack. Oh, he he played it really close to Spock. The rest of them, like Nurse Chapel, was really cool as that. Um, she played a witch, I think. Uh, yeah, like a like a healer, I think. Yeah, she was like a good powers. witch. Yeah, with powers. And she was very. Uh, I for a while I didn't realize it was her because she was doing so well. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> <That's> so cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah you're right. She's like, got all, so much presence. Um, everyone played something else. Um, yeah. yeah, and Hura got to be the evil queen. Oh my god, I love yeah. that. Oh wow, that was. Anson Mount got to be like the the scaredy cat yeah <laughs> like, didn't want yeah yeah like warm totally yeah he's uh he's amazing and then ortegas was so cool as yeah as, yeah um, yeah and una una i think una had a little uh, that was my only reservation in this episode that her her role was so small and i yeah. would have loved to see more more of una and that you know una in in general is do you remember that one short trek where Spock and Una get in the elevator and then there were two, it was a great, actually it was a great short trek except for two major things that could easily be removed. Okay, number one, and you know all this, right? Number one, the, 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 the turbo lift was like, the shaft of the turbo lift was like gargantuanly huge, like way bigger than it could ever be. 
<laughs> on the Enterprise. And everybody's like, what the heck is going on? And we like in the in the TARDIS of the Doctor Who or something. So that yeah. was number one. Number two, <laughs> the two of them breaking into a song and singing was a bit too much for that. But I was like, you could easily fix this. Just hack out all the turbo lift scenes and then take out the song. And then you got a really good short track. Well, I, I beg to defer on both occasions. I'll explain why. First okay. of all, this was my first experience with Star Trek as a composer. So I definitely remember that short. Oh, you did the music for it? Yes. The, this oh, was I know that. my entry into Star Trek. That was your, your, your whatever, your... My score. Your initiation. Yes, it was my first day Oh, wow. Day good thing you caught that one. Similar okay. Talk, it was my first day on the Enterprise. Um, so, yeah, the first thing I will say, I agree with you on the elevator. Like, you know, the chefs were way too big, but mm -hmm. I think they wanted to establish a cinematic moment um, that, that may have been missing. And they needed, like, you know, cut wise, editorial wise, they needed, you know, a shift between the scene and the corridor of the Enterprise. Okay to the court, you know, and then they needed to show how they got to the bridge and all of that and that rescues them. So I can I, get that. I have um, a solution. Actually, I said that wrong. What I should have said is instead of cut out the triple chef scenes, what you would do is you would just zoom in, crop it in oh, so yeah. that you just see the turbo lift within this rather small space. And you'd yeah, still know it's in a shaft, but don't have this big wide shot of this huge cavernous yeah, empty I mean, space. Yeah. <laughs> I'll know. give you that, yes. <laughs> uh, and then the other, the, the thing with the song I actually liked because it was such a, you know, Spock's first day on the Enterprise, he's he's still, you know, he's a young, you know, cadet, right? Like He's a young uh, Spock. I think he was cadet at the time. Or Okay. We'll have to watch it again. Spock, sorry, he was Ensign Spock, but he's still very, very young, and and he's still still not entirely in control of his emotions. And part of the whole thing was to show that he's learning restraint, kind of like Una is, you know, not showing that side of her. And you know, maybe it was a little overdone, but it was. I thought it was over the top. I mean, I was really by now. Interestingly enough, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I was really expecting Strange New Worlds to really build on Spock and Una's relationship, but they didn't. Oh man. I, it's I, more, it's much more Spock and Nurse Chapel and Spock and T'Pring. Yeah. I wish, know? I wish they would go for that. Actually. I think you're right. Um, hopefully we'll see more maybe season two. Now. I think they should start building on Una more in general. Yeah. Uh, She's yeah. been kind of aloof. And I was like, I was expecting her to be more involved. Yeah. But then of course the original number one in the cage was pretty aloof. So, yeah. But we're not doing the, you know. That's true. <laughs> we're not doing uh, the original series. So also, the cage was uh, a pilot that didn't get picked up. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, it had a lot of things that you know today would not work. You know, would not pass a screen. Um, yeah. You know, Pike's comment on on seeing a woman on on the bridge was obviously. <laughs> that was uh, the sixties. Fixed in, in, yeah. in Strange New World uh, because he's surrounded by women on the bridge. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, but I, I would I agree with you. I would love to see more of Una in general and and build on on the, that relationship with Spock because yeah, I mean that's especially that it was it was kind of the pilot of our show. Q&A. Yeah. Um, so. It's yeah. of course I'm not really complaining. I'm just surprised. I just they just went in a different direction because I mean she's got to build her identity by being pals with um um Lan. oh shoot how do we say sing sings Lan Yunin Sing Lan Yunin okay Lan Yunin Sing yeah it's it's difficult Lan Yunin anyway her <laughs> yeah um oh, oh I, she got to play a completely different character too in the in the fantasy episode oh my god that was so much fun yeah yeah fun. yeah uh, princess talia yeah yeah that was so fun. do you get to hang out with all these actors oh man i wish the, the first time i met them was the premiere actually i, I met um i met anson mount and and uh, uh ethan peck uh who plays spock uh right. in star trek day like a year and a half ago <laughs> um but then and then the next time i met them was in the premiere in new york um nice so i unfortunately i don't interact with the actors uh i wish i did <laughs> would have been really fun <laughs> well that, that was a life goal <laughs> yeah, uh oh, sure. my internet connection is unstable. Ooh. But it didn't we didn't lose any frames or any sound. 
Ooh, well, my wife, okay. I had to twist my wife's arm to watch um, Lower Decks, but she did start watching it. Oh, but great. I couldn't get her to watch Discovery. She just didn't like it at all. And then, but, and then I kind of had to coax her to watch The Orville, but she likes it. Oh, good. Okay. And I was trying to get her to watch The Expanse, but I just couldn't get her to sink her teeth into it. Hmm. And um, Strange New Worlds, she watched half an episode, and she's like, I love this show. Oh, great. Oh, <laughs> wow. So, of course, she has the hots for Anson Mount. Oh, well, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah. seriously, who doesn't? I mean, that guy is just such yeah, a he's great. Like, so he's what's the deal with the hairspray? Oh, my God. I don't what? know. I'm like. <laughs> Sign me up for all the hairs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I saw um, a GIF from like someone on Twitter put like um, Pike's hair on her tigas. <laughs> yeah. You see that? It was hilarious because <laughs> it works. It works. It, it looks amazing. Like, it, you know, um, looks like an older, you know, Admiral or Tegas kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad your wife likes it. That's, that's yeah, she cool. does. She really digs it. I mean, who wouldn't? It's just, it's a great show. It's just like, and the thing is, is like, um, um, since I'm a YouTuber, I do a lot of editing and then I've got like fan series and stuff. And so like, I look at a show from a technical point of view too. Yeah. And then I've taken some acting lessons and stuff. So, wow. I mean, everything. So, and I, so I'm listening to the music. I'm trying to, I'm noticing the directing. I'm noticing the acting. I'm noticing the lighting, everything about it. Plus trying to enjoy the show. Right. <laughs> I will say, okay, I want, I'll say one thing. Like when I watched um, um, Prodigy, Prodigy, because it's a kid's show, didn't really suck me in that much. So I could, I kind of could, I really enjoyed the music and the visuals. Yeah. And uh, Strange New Worlds, I get sucked into the show and I start taking the music for granted a lot of the time. Oh. And I have to keep telling <laughs> myself, wait, that's, that's Nami's stuff. You got to listen, you know. Oh. So I don't know. Do you have less cues in that? I do know there's more empty space where there's no music. Well, in Strange New Worlds. Not, not less cues uh, because ultimately we're doing a longer show. So most episodes will have about forty-seven to forty-eight minutes of music, which is a lot. Wow. <laughs> uh, well, Prodigy, I have twenty-two minutes every time. Oh, um, because it's a half-hour show. Yeah, it's a ah, half-hour show. Okay, yeah. that uh, makes so sense. It, it, so you got to spread it out some. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and there's the strange new world simply, you know, the pace of it allows you to do longer cues and also have mm -hmm. more silence. Like in, in Prodigy, we probably have throughout the entire first season, which you haven't built, you know, it hasn't been fully aired yet because it's only 10 episodes are out and we're working on the next 10. But in mm -hmm. all of that, you have maybe three minutes, two to three minutes of silence in the entire show. <laughs> maybe they think that since it's a kid's show, you got to have some kind of candy all the time. Well, yes. Keeping no, the I people think engaged or something. Part of the animation thing. Uh, I think yeah. animation, because you create everything, right? You don't have footage to work with. You create everything you hear or see is created by artists. So, okay. um, so music does really help in, in navigating the story. And, and especially that it shifts so quickly. Usually, you know, what will happen in Strange New Worlds in five minutes in Prodigy will have to happen in 50 seconds. So, okay. you know, just because of that time, you know, so you got to just really tell it musically really and, and it fast. Is more of okay. A show, yeah, for sure. Also, you know, you got a bunch of kids. Who, it's it has to it has a faster pace, um, which you know is good and bad at the same time. Like I I love it. I I, I really enjoy writing animation. Like it's it's just. Well, you must because you're so good at it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I, this is a searing question that I have to ask. Is that okay. so? And I think I asked you once before on DM or something, but like. So what notation program do you use? Um, I use Sibelius. Okay. Um, I use yeah, Finale. I like, I like Sibelius. Okay. Um, it's, I tried Finale. It's, it's not. Finale. You know, there's two different camps. I mean, I know a couple of comp composers that use both, but usually it's like you, you kind of use the one you started with. And then once you somewhat invested, you never want to change. Yeah. Well, but, when yeah. I started out, there was an, it's software was called Noteworthy Composer or something like that. And mm. I didn't know English very well. And I thought it was not worthy, <laughs> not worthy. And I yeah. didn't realize that it's a note 
Noteworthy. Like, no, like a musical note. <laughs> noteworthy, like someone Every worthy set. of a Wikipedia yeah. page. You must have note, notability yeah, it's, at it's your a, page. It's of, yeah, English yeah. language. Yeah. Okay, so you do an in and then you just score it out in a conductor's score, it sounds like. What? Sorry? So you have a full conductor's score. Yes. It's not um, a piano score, a reduced score, or anything like that. You, so no, you, it's a full conductor score because, I don't, again, I don't... Um, it, it, but I will say it's only for the live instruments. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we're not noting, uh, you know, uh, let's say a keyboard part or a timpani part. Like it. Okay, you just play it. I I'm just saying what ends up going to the orchestra is only what we record. Like if you're okay. not recording a snare drum, there's no reason that the snare drum will be listed on the score. I mean, yes, technically there is a reason for that. Like it, oh. it should be. If in, a, in a, an ideal world where there was time and money to you know, to do that, then we would, because it will help the mix, uh, the score mix. But, but how do you, are you the one when you, for the non scored out instruments, are you the one who plays them? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sometimes I play them in, sometimes I will uh, program them. So, you know, like in a piano roll type of thing or something. Yeah. Okay, and then yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll create like modulation and expression and all of that MIDI, uh, MIDI automations. Um, the little wheel. Real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I'll add, you know, the, the, actually, I, I sometimes I add reverb, but then I have to mute it because when the mixer mixes it, um, he usually wants it without. Right. Without right. Um, but if there's a certain effect that I really want to use, like for, mm -hmm. um, you know, sound toys or something like that, then that will be included in my delivery to it with the stems to the mixer. Do you ever use bongo drums in your scores? Uh, I think I've used it only one time, but that was on Prodigy. Because <laughs> I happen to see something that looks like a bongo drum in the background. Okay, so again, the thing that's most impressive is you just got to fly through these scores to get to put out that much music that quick. I mean, you just don't look back, right? You just... <laughs> you just how do you input it generally? I do, I do second guess myself all the time. Okay. Um, and that is very time consuming. And, and I think actually my best work happens when I'm very stressed uh, and when I don't have time to overthink. Mm -hmm. um, just go I, for it. I just go for it. And it's mm -hmm. like first or second instinct. And that's it. Yeah, pretty um, much. And oftentimes that's the best work. So uh, do you yeah. how, how do you actually input the notes? Do you use the keyboard or do you use a mouse or do you use I, like I, the keystrokes or? I like to write them into a piano roll. Oh, that's how you do it? That's not the most convenient way, but it's the most like efficient way because that way I don't have to like start with quantization and all of that. Um, okay. And just like, and, and, you know, occasionally I will, I will, you know, record a melody like, you know. Okay. Like, now, do you, do you do all the articulations or does your orchestrator do the articulations and stuff? Um, so the articulations, as I was saying, there's like 600 um, channels approximately on my tracks, on my my template. Um, okay. What happens with that is that let's say I, we look at violin one, okay? Mm -hmm. So violin one has a track of um, articulation. So it would be like the short, um, you know, staccato, staccatissimo. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have, you know, a, a track for pizzicato and you'll have a track for marcato and you'll have a track mm -hmm. for legato mm -hmm. uh, or sustains. And mm -hmm. you'll have a track for, you know, all sorts of uh, techniques um, like mm -hmm. uh, um, colengo or whatever. Right. Um, and so it, 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 it happens that every instrument and the orchestra has approximately seven or eight articulations. And then that way, when I deliver to the orchestrator, it's already mapped on the exact channel where he can, you know, he'll open it on his end and see, okay, violin pizzicato, na 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 na. Violin legato, na 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 na. And, and right. then, then he will convert it into values and do you know the actual notation okay but i'm talking about like this so like like here's a cello piece i don't know if you see this yeah yeah that's beautiful so wow. it's got in inside this there's slurs you know and stuff like that so like do you like yeah. like when the when the orchestra finally gets their parts like the violin parts have to have articulation figured out there's no way in the world you can sight read something on two takes yeah, and have it sound good unless it's all written out perfectly. Exactly. That's so, and that's what the orchestration guy does. 
Or girl, yeah, depends. Yeah. But okay, yes. so like they slur, they do those slurs, all the accents, yeah. and the, so it's not they just whether you're pizzicato or arco, yeah. but it's everything else. And uh, do they also write in the dynamics? Yeah, dynamics, techniques, um, uh, tempo changes, or you know, alerts that there's tempo changes, uh, instrumentation changes. Okay. Um, any any tech any instruction any uh feel that like or or sometimes you know if, if there would be a certain request like oh this needs to be banding or or uh, you know wh whatever especially with the alert alert aleatoric music um mm. that like a lot of times you'll want something that you can't really demo like you can't create it with the proper demo but right. the orchestra will get it like once you know once it's written properly so that's that's the orchestrators or that's what they do okay because one thing that this early Star Trek did is they did a lot of really wild experimental sounds that would be hard to notate, actually. Like, um, like there's that string one that's ta da ta da 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 you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah. And then there's like, and then there's other stuff where like there's like bass guitar that's picked, that's like kind of da da da. Da, 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 da. all kinds of super cool stuff and then there's like tune timpanis they have things where you got like five timpanis and they're playing the melody mm. and then cool yeah. stuff on clarinets you know all kinds of really wild stuff that they did in that show that's just yeah. super cool yeah it's amazing now now you make me want to do the, the bass thing i'm gonna find a place for it <laughs> yeah yeah wow i'm a boy yeah. So okay. now we have eight minutes left. You got to go, right? Uh, let me, let me, one sec. I'll, I'm going to email the person I'm supposed to talk to. Okay. Like I said, I mean, we get, we run out of time and we're like, it seems like we barely even talked about anything yet. Right. Well, <laughs> we can always have another interview later. That's the other possibility. I'm just going to ask if we can push. Okay. okay. Well, here's another question. So, I mean, how did you land this gig? As a, um, I mean, there's so many talented people out there, but there's only so many slots to fill, right? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I got lucky. Um, I got lucky. Uh, so I worked with uh, Michael Giacchino on... Um, rather well-known composer. Rather well-known composer. <laughs> and much more than that. Um, yeah. But like, uh, yeah, so we worked together on an American Pickle. Um, so how'd that happen? Uh, I pitched on it. And uh, right. yeah, because it, it, it was a good fit for, you know, my, my composing style. And okay, so it wasn't just pure luck. You actually went out there and you convinced him that you were the person that he needs. Well, yes and no. So um, basically when, when producers in Hollywood want to, you know, uh, find a composer for their film, uh -huh. uh, they would e either reach out for a certain composer um, or they'll put out a call saying, oh, we're looking for this kind of score mm -hmm. or this kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then they'll accept pitches. And so these okay. things usually go out to an agencies who are, um, there's like a couple of major agencies and I'm with one of them, uh, Gorfin Schwartz. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, so they, they, they requested uh, reels for, for that particular project. And that was, um, you know, a very Jewish oriented film. Cool. Uh, and so it had to have like a klezmer, klezmer and inspiration and then uh, comedy and uh, a little bit of drama and fantasy too, because it's a fantastical idea of like a person who's being grind for a hundred years and wakes up a hundred years later. So it's a fish out of the water. Uh, with a fantastical element. So, um, so all of this was, you know, the request. And then I pitched on this, I, I, I created some tracks, um, and I sent some previous materials that I had that would fit that, n you know, narrative. So did they um, give you the scene that you were supposed to score the music to? Did you have the visuals? This was not too visual. They, they haven't shot the film at like actually, they did shoot the film, but they, they didn't share any any footage. Okay. Um, so this was just based on the log line. Uh, okay. At the time, um, and then I pitched on it. They liked my reel, uh, but they actually wanted to work with Michael because uh, Seth Rogen's production. Um, they have worked with Michael before on other mm -hmm. films, 50-50. 
Um, and so uh, since I have the same agent as Michael, um, the, the idea was that we'll do it together. Um, right. And so we did like he he wrote a suite of the themes and then i took that you know with a four minute uh sequence and i created 68 minutes of four right um so then he saw what i can do and he started kind of um you know uh working with me on other things great and, uh it, after that like um how long ago was this this is three years ago oh wow this is really recent yeah it's would you recent. consider him to be your mentor now or um, yes. I mean, he's, he's both a mentor and a friend. Oh, great. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot from him. It's like, it's like an unofficial, you know, mentor in a way. Great. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like the way that he's doing things like I, mm -hmm. I and that's how I want to operate when I grow up. Um, so yeah, so, so he basically, you know, he's like, I said, you're just a kid. You're not even 40 years old yet. I know. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so he's you know he's he's doing the Star Trek the Calvin timeline uh, movies, and uh, Alex mm -hmm. Goodman and him collaborated on many things. And then uh, plus, didn't he do the theme for Prodigy? What didn't uh, Michael do the theme for yeah, Prodigy? Yeah, but, okay. but the first thing was actually Q and A. So that was the first thing that I did with Star Trek. And yeah. then after Alex saw what I did with Q and A, he was like, well. Here's Prodigy. And the idea was that Michael will do the main theme and I will do the score, uh, kind of as we did on Pickle and as we did mm -hmm. on Medal of Honor and other projects. And so um, that's how it worked. That's um, really great. After screen, after Prodigy, um, after I delivered the first pilot, um, they asked me to do Strange New Worlds. So it was all kind of a- You hit the jackpot. Okay, I gotta ask this question. I forgot to ask this one. So. Um, Oh, Maybe I'm lucky. wrong. Oops. We did get lucky. Okay. So now, now how much time we got? Um, I, I told him 7.30, so. <laughs> okay. Ooh, we got 17 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Rapid fire. Let's just start talking faster, get more syllables in. Okay. <laughs> um, so, oh, dang it. Now I forgot what I was going to ask. Oh, yeah. So, um, so do you, what do you, what's it like being a woman in this industry where it's mostly guys all over the place? Um. Well, I like guys. Okay. I have, I, you know, I've, I've been surrounded by guys like a lot. <laughs> I like guys. Okay. Would um, you consider yourself a tomboy? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I think I was a tomboy growing up uh, okay. a little bit. I had like, for example, my cousin had like this short hair and I really, you know, he was like my best friend at the time. And I also, okay. hair. Uh, but I'm very girly. So I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm you know, I, I like my feminine side and I like my less feminine side um but yeah okay. so, so I get along with guys really well so you can just hang with the guys yeah but but yeah I mean there there is you know there there is a problem like today we had a zoom meeting earlier um you okay. know for, for one of the Star Trek shows and I was the only girl and girl I was the only woman in the room where you had like 12 men and mm -hmm. you know while this is cool and nice it's not cool and it's not nice because like there should not be this gap like we're 51 right. percent of the population approximately i know so it's weird where are all the girls and um it's it's like disproportionate um and and you know it's i feel like it's slowly changing in tv world but we're still like a right. hundred years you know well it's it's of, a weird phenomenon because like for example um I just did, I mean, the, the concert that I did that had our, my cello concerto on it was a bunch of new music. The, the entire concert was brand new music. Every single piece on it was a premiere. And almost all the composers were there, which has made it really cool because I, I was also the MC, and I would ask each composer to come up and talk a little bit about their piece. Oh, cool. Right before we played it. And then we got to go to a barbecue at my house afterwards. It was just really cool. And then we were all wearing, like, we weren't wearing tuxes or black. We were just wearing, like, I was wearing my, one of my internet shirts. <laughs> and I told people to get wear an internet shirt or wear, wear a Hawaii shirt or something like that. Anyways, it was just all really fun. But the thing was, I realized afterwards, every single composer on that concert was a white guy. Yeah. And I was uh, like, oops. Beautiful. Yeah. But I, but to my credit, I actually asked. There were two two women that I asked to be on the concert, 
but they both, and they're both very talented and the world really contributed to it, but they, for whatever reason, they were busy and they couldn't do it. Mm. So, so I don't know why that is. I mean, I mean, cause there's plenty of women that are musicians, right? And that just, for some reason, doesn't seem to be as many composers. I don't know why. Do you have any ideas why that is? I'm not sure why. I think, I think the whole thing started as a boys club. <laughs> like, uh -huh. you know, women were not doing a lot of things, not just scoring. They were not doing, they were not directing. They were not um, producing. They were not writing. They were not editing. Okay. So it, it, it is, it, it is a whole industry thing. It's not just the composing. Uh, okay. But yeah, Hollywood did start as a boys club and, and boys club are try are, are hard to, to break into, right? Because mm -hmm. let's say a producer is used to working with a certain person mm -hmm. and that person has done, you know, 20 years worth of work with this person, right? So, um, and he's done a great job. So why, you know, why would you even bother yeah. Him. He's yeah why take a chance on somebody so, that you're not sure is going to come through exactly and yeah. then and then there is the thing where a lot of times people thought like women are less good with technology women are less like you know it's it, because you know why why always oh, dumbass actually bullshit reasons I agree you know I might as well just say it <laughs> I agree yeah. with you. and i don't feel like i don't feel like i can do like things less good than a man in fact I think obviously not. You're like the like the number one composer right now. Right, but I there is a point to that because um, you know most women I I know have to prove themselves beyond what you know the standard would be for a man in this. Mm -hmm. And yep. so a lot of super capable composers are out there waiting for an opportunity, and I got lucky. Mm -hmm. I got a, an ally. I got a big ally. You know. Okay. Michael. Do you or, find Michael? Does Michael sometimes have to sit? To stick up for you and you know like no I, I i that's not the case but what i'm saying so you're able got, to just hold your own with all I the got guys a, person, a big guy who's saying she's great take take a chance and that's okay. what you know that's what happened with alex gritzman he took a chance and he was not disappointed because he hired me on two shows right yeah so the thing is not a lot of guys will go out and say she's great you know, this is this is something that, you know, I, I am beyond grateful to Michael to do. Well, to I'll do. say it. I know you're I can tell. I mean, she is great. Yeah. But what Folks, I mean, and I knew that. And the thing is, I'm not even bullshitting. I listen to your music. I hear it. And I'm like, this is really good. I know. This is way better than any of the other <laughs> Star Trek shows. Oh, like, wow. it's as good yeah. as I mean. So <laughs> like your music is the best of what we got now. And then we've got the original series and everything in between. I can't even remember anything that in it really, except for the theme songs, but I can't hum a single tune or give you any kind of like the original star Trek. And you use that, right? And then like, or like, you know, what's the, what's the Romulan theme? The, oh, how does oh, it go? I should know this. I should know this. There's um, so many great themes that are background music that aren't da -dee, da 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 da. That you know, the, what's some other ones? You know, there's so many good ones. Anyways. Um. Okay, but what about da 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 ba 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 da. Yeah. Which I love. I mean, this is I, I think Chris is an amazing composer. Like yep. um, and I, I personally learn a lot from Lord X. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually do love do really, really, really love that score. Uh and yeah. I have to listen to it and repeat maybe <laughs> um, yeah. what I mean is like, you know, I think a lot of women you know, we, we need those allies, those big guys, you mm -hmm. know, the Oscars um, who will come and say, take a chance on her. And I'm not talking about me specifically okay. saying in general, like, I wish people would take that chance. I mean, you took, you know, you're, you're doing that. Like, you know, you invited those women to, to mm -hmm. do the, the concert. Um, yeah. And I feel, you know, people, you know, people should do that. Like, yeah. just take a chance. Um, well, okay. So now have you ever, like, what happens if you do have some guys that are just being jerks? Do you just quietly take it or do you get in their face and 
<laughs> How about this? No, no, Knock no it off. To me. Uh, honestly, there's one time in all of my years here. Well, not a lot of years, but eight mm. years. One time where a friend of mine actually got super, super, super drunk. Okay. And so I will give him that, that he was like wasted and probably on weed too. And he said something that was like completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, dude, you, you just go to sleep right now and we'll talk in the morning. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, and then he, you know, he read what he said because it was te weird texting. Okay. Um, this was like a bigger composer than me. And I was working for him a little bit. Um, okay. and, and then he was like, you know, super apologetic and like, this will never happen again. And it never happened again. Um, okay. But I got lucky. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, at this point, no one's going to ever say anything or, or do anything like um, so I, I, you know, but I also I'm, I'm coming for, with a lot of confidence and I feel like. Okay you don't come with a lot of confidence then then this thing will you know people will say things and people will hurt you and okay yeah well i mean just looking at the way you are you just put out a lot of positive energy yeah so that's just who you are then you're just, i mean well, there's yeah. so much you're just like glowing all the time and you just yeah but i'm also owning it you know because mm -hmm. you've, said, you've said several times you're good at your job you're, you're good and i'm like yes i am i am good at my job and I'm owning it from day one that I was here, even before I was a Star Trek person, mm -hmm. even before I had like big gigs. And I think that's part of like, you know, establishing who you are. And, and if you're confident, no one will try to, to minimize you, whether you're a woman or, or whatever. Like, you know, it's it will just not be an option. Um, yeah, I, I can see that from confidence. Um, yeah, you're very and, confident, but you're also very comfortable with yourself. You're very comfortable with who you are. <laughs> I can see that. I can totally see that. Of course, I've ha I've watched a couple other interviews that you've been on, so I kind of know a little bit about you from that. But I mean, yeah. so. Oh, cool. Yeah. So where does that come from? I you were just born that way, or like did you learn oh, that no, from your I mom was, or? I was a shy kid. Um, I okay. think I do think confidence comes from your your. My parents were super supportive. Okay. Like even you know, and I look at my older photos. I'm like you know, with that short hair. When the time I was, I wanted to be like my cousin, and I'm mm -hmm. like, oh my god, this was a terrible look. <laughs> and <laughs> and but they, I remember they saying like, you do what you know. We believe that you know, you go for the music, you do the things that you want to do, or you want to be uh, a chemist, go be a chemist. You want to be a pharmacist, be a pharmacist. You want to be a vet, you want to do music mm -hmm. for film. Um, so they were all that was supportive and they were like, you know, you got this, you got this. And if I didn't want to go to, if I didn't want to go to school, they were like, okay, you know, but you know, you still have to make your grades. And I did, mm -hmm. I always did, but they were like, you don't have to go to school if you don't want to. Um, so, so that, that's, you know, I think a lot of the confidence came from them. Um, okay. There was the when did you discover that you were a composer? I didn't, I don't, I don't know that I'm a composer. <laughs> you are, what do you mean? You're not a composer. You totally are a composer. Uh, so, well, I guess, yeah. I mean, for around 13 or 14, I started writing songs. Okay. Um, that was, that was the composing. That's where composing began. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, I wrote, like I, I would play things on piano. Like I would play the Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter theme and like Forrest Gump, all those, those you know, mm -hmm. big, um, big, nice melodies from the movies. And then I saw that I can do it too, you know, because if, if it's just chords and melody, I can write it. Right. Mm -hmm. You can be a composer once you understand, you know, you understand melody, you understand harmony, you understand rhythm and texture that mm -hmm. or, or color, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the things that form music. Um, mm -hmm. and, and once you get that, it's like it becomes a, an easy thing. Um, you know, when you remove all this, uh, the, the psychological uh, uh, barriers of like, oh, I can't, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and also I'm like, OK, well, I'm not comparing myself to John Williams. There's no mm -hmm. point. You know, I'm comparing myself to to who I was like, you know, two years ago. So mm -hmm. with that understanding, you're like, okay, I'll develop, I'll, I'll write more. And well, I'll some other people might compare you to John Williams. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely not. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, he just gained confidence with time, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, it took him a long time before he, he became a household name. That's true. You know? So, uh, same um, for me. It takes a while. <laughs> yeah. But wow. Okay. Oof. Oh, yeah, that was a good question, though. I have to say, it's one of the best questions I've ever been asked. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I shoot, I had another good follow-up one on that one, too. Wow. Oh, yeah. So, you know, like when we learn music theory, they make such a big deal about harmony, you know, and all that, right? Mm -hmm. And chords and stuff. Yeah. But to tell you the truth, and I think Mozart was one of the persons that said this, is that it's not 
the harmony, it's the rhythm. Because mm -hmm. I mean, every if you, you can boil down just about any pop tune down to a handful of different chord progressions, right? And even most great melodies all fit in a couple of different, you know, one, four, five, one, or one, four, five, six, three, one, or whatever. But it's how you emphasize it with the, with the rhythm mm -hmm. is what makes it. And they never really, really told us that in, in theory class. Cause they were, they were so stuck on the harmony, harmonic analysis all the time. Yeah. I, you know? I agree. That's a, uh... That's a very good um, observation. And then uh, I, I will say in counter, counterpoint um, class, mm -hmm. um, they often actually do teach you about um, the rhythmic element of like how, how, how your different lines should, you know, kind of start in different um, or, or complement each other in, in, in different rhythmic structures. Mm -hmm. And that will create this, you know, flourishing feel. Um, right. or, or sometimes, you know, you start a melody um, on, on like not the downbeat, but like a little bit after, and, and that will actually really, really lift it up. So I, I think, I think rhythm was discussed a little bit in, in my studies, Go oh, good. Okay. That, but, but it was, it is very helpful. Like I, I hundred percent agree. Um, it is. Yeah. It's the thing. Think about I it. mean, it's all about emphasis, what you're going to emphasize and that's all done through the rhythm, Yeah. you know, and dynamics too. But I mean, you know, I mean, for example, like if you go, da da, or you can go da da. <laughs> That's two completely different feels, and they're the exact same notes, right? Yeah. Because the rhythm's different. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and that's uh, that's actually all the copyright stuff are are about um, that really. That's a whole other subject. I could, um, I could argue for hours on that one. Totally different. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's what they told us at school. This is this was actually part of the class that like, if you want to use something and um, you want to make it like a sound alike, so it will sound similar. Let's say the producer want you know wants Titanic, right? They mm -hmm. love Titanic. They love that 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 theme, um, and they want something super similar, but you can't do it. So if you change the rhythm, it will actually be considered you know a new thing. <laughs> yeah but then that's hilarious to me like <laughs> um but because it's yeah so different um anyway. or i think i don't know you might even be able to just modulate it to a different key and get away with it um yes and no like you can't you can't take the exact rhythm and the exact notes and modulate it it will not be that would definitely yeah i mean that whole subject there's so much in that i mean like so is somebody going to claim a copyright on bomb 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 you want to know how many pieces start that way? No, you but know, that's one, three, yeah. five. I think uh, yeah. I think copyright starts from five notes or six. Bom 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 bom. There's a jillion pieces that start like that. That's you know, um, but of but course that, they're all public domain. That, you know, that, that can be considered harmony rather than notes. Like what? Red, okay, red, wait. Red, Bum ba bum ba 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 bum bum ba bum ba 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 bum. Isn't that a melody? Uh, that is Mozart. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, bum 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 There's yeah. nine notes. That's not copyrighted anymore. You, everyone can use it. Right. It's public domain because it's so old. It's uh, but, yeah. yeah. It has the seventy years of uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. One sec. Uh, I'm gonna see if we can push it a little. So, is somebody gonna try to copyright a minor seventh and say you can't go dotty? Because that sounds too much like da di da 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 da. Um, well, in Star Trek, I can do, I can just simply quote because um, CBS owns, owns that, that own, owns that material. Okay, hold on. Um, Alexander Courage will still get royalties and everything will bum, be. Ba, bum, <laughs> bum, bum, bum. You said you have to. You can do five notes. I think five or six. I'm not sure. Okay, so bum pa bum pa pa. So we could go that far without being bum pa bum pa 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 pa. So you can just go bum pa pa, and everybody knows it's Star Trek. Yeah. No, that that will already kind of. Um, yeah. Oh boy. Have you ever gotten dinged on like you wrote a cue and you 
scored it all out and it's all perfect and then somebody says you know no, we can't use it because it's a copyright strike there's a violation that we can't use it um i have it it has not happened in that way um there were a couple of times in my career yes that um there you know either the orchestrator was like that reminds me of this and that and i'm like oh shit i may you know this is a little close we'll not do that and then there was there was one time where it came from the executive and he was like this reminds me of this and i'm like i really don't see how and i heard i listened to the song again and again i'm like i don't see how but in order to make him happy i'm gonna get it out okay so the main okay you gotta go by the way um so the star trek theme the star trek strange new world theme right when it ends when it starts wrapping up and you know a lot of times there'll be a cool theme but then you feel like they did kind of a abrupt ending because they ran out of time yeah you know well like in the end of the strange new world theme he suddenly goes da 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 or no and I'm like, that's from Top Gun, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right into the danger zone. It's not, it's not those notes. It's da 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 da, da. and then, then it ends and that theme's over. I actually sent a DM to uh, what was what, who's the guy's name who did that? Jeff Rizzo. Yeah, I sent a DM to him. I said, did you? purposely quote danger zone there or was that an accident but he never <laughs> responded to me but we don't know uh, it's still well, I, I cannot i cannot speak for jeff because i yeah. i'm not sure what was uh i i do know that like you know you can't exceed a certain amount of time um right. on on these titles so you know uh it had to it had to stop <laughs> i think what also happens is sometimes um they'll write a longer title theme and then the director says, well, I like it, but it's too long. And then they have to hack it and they have to do an abrupt tag at the end to wrap it up. Well, knowing Jeff, yeah. I don't think that he did something like that because, okay. uh, you know, I think, I think that originally he was going to do a 90, like, I think it's a 90 second, right? Um, okay. I, I think they, they actually. I haven't yet timed it to tell the truth. Okay. Yeah. Usually <laughs> 90, 90 seconds. Usually. Okay. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think that he did it longer. Uh, okay. Not that I know of, at least. So. Well, bravo. Thank you. I am your super fan. <laughs> do you get invited to conventions now? Uh, I do. I'm going to make an appearance in in the San Diego in Comic-Con. Yes. Are you? <laughs> oh, dang, because I already went to Comic-Con a while. I went to that one. That's so cool. I, I never uh, been, so I'm, I'm super excited. What about Star Trek Las Vegas? Uh, I don't know. It's it's in August, and August is going to be filled with Prodigy and Se Strange New World season two. For it's me. really fun. I went uh, last year, and I had a blast. So yeah, I, I, it's just we'll see if I have the time. I mean, it's going to. And be then I could walk down the hall and go, "Hi, Naomi," and you can go, "Hi, Matt," and I'm like, "See, <laughs> she knows me." When is it? When is it? It's well, like you said, it's like August twenty sixth, I think. August, okay. I think it starts August twenty third and work goes to the weekend or something. Okay, yeah. I, All the cool people are going to be there. I know, but I <laughs> doubt that I can do that. I'm not as cool, I guess. Um, yeah. but it, yeah, Oh, wait a sec. You live in L.A., right? I live in L.A. I'm very close. But, it just uh, so happens I am going to... Two. This, Space Command. Oh, cool. Which is um, Mark... Mark Zickery's project. It's got a bunch of Star Trek alumni on it. And anyways, there's a red carpet screening, so I'll be in LA. So we can go out to coffee. Remember that? way way back when I asked you if you wanted to go out to coffee because I was yeah. down there visiting my aunt. And you're like, um, I'm like too busy, but maybe next time. Yeah, well, maybe next time. <laughs> I like As I said, my summer is going to be a, a crazy summer. That's why I, I know that's exactly what you said last time. Because summer is have like- time to drink one nice. cup of coffee. With Maybe. some weird dude for the Sanskrit uh, oh, when name, is it? YouTube channel. When is it? Um, well, <laughs> uh, let's see. I think it's in July. Oh, July is is. It's, it's July. <laughs> well, try to do two. No, uh, I'll just. I'll tell you what I have in July. Okay. I have, but you have to eat lunch. I mean, maybe you could just eat lunch somewhere and I, say, I, I Matt, I'm eating lunch here. I have two episodes of Star Trek: Strange New Worlds. I yeah, have what? Two episodes, two episodes of Star Trek Prodigy and a feature film that I need to Okay, do. I give up. You're too busy. You're too and busy. 
And there's Comic Con, so I will okay. be absent from my studio for two days, uh, which is a lot. No, I need to be appreciative. I need to be happy that that you occasionally respond to my direct messages on Twitter when I have time. Yeah. And yeah, because you're busy and like you got all these people DMing you and like you need a you need your own like uh, attendant to or or is that really you responding or is it somebody else pretending to be you? Oh, it, it is me. I I don't have that kind of a okay. And also, I should, I'm very appreciative to have you on the show here. So. Well, I'm very appreciative that for the first of all, thank you for the invite. And oh yeah, thank you for the very thoughtful discussions because I learned a lot. Um, oh, I learned a lot too. I like perspectives, and I like you know, and I like that. I particularly like that question about confidence because that mm -hmm. really made me think a lot. And and I I probably have like a whole hour uh, of of things that i'm thinking now but um oh, okay you know uh, what we should actually <laughs> maybe we should do a follow-up interview and we'll try we can go into that sometime about yeah. more about that part of it after the summer and then maybe you can play the guitar <laughs> next time too i see like three guitars back there oh yeah i do i i like the the Schechter the most uh these days i'm, I'm very much enjoying it i was um, kind of hoping to play the cello with you but we ran out of time uh, so, cool. next time um, but yeah, so anyway, thank you. This, this was really, thank you. So um, do we, are there things we want to put in the link? Like, do you have a website for yourself? Uh, well, it's namicomposer.com. So okay. <laughs> there. Ta -da. And then, um, your Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is Nami Composer. Right. And then I'll put them all down there. And then are you on Facebook? Uh, I am on Facebook, uh, also by Nami I think it's Nami Film Composer, actually. Okay, and then are, is that kind of a somewhat public page yeah, too? Yeah, it's or? Also like a public page thing. Um, yeah. Did I Facebook message you you once? I maybe I did. I think maybe. I don't know. I. I think, I, or maybe I wish you happy birthday or something. Could be. Uh, I don't really check up like. As we might be Facebook friends now that I think about it. I got like a thousand, two thousand friends, so I kind of like lose track. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, Twitter is, is a better, the better. Um, way for me to, to end. Okay. I just, um, I'm, I don't know. And then I'm, of course, if then they should, so if they go to your website, then you have a place for business inquiries or whatever. Uh, and well, then directs you to your agent or something like that, or business inquiries go through, through my agent, Maria. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, Okay, for one final question. So is there any um, any love interests in your life currently? Or oh, man. Are you busy for that? That's a good question. Uh, no, I am. I am. I don't have any partner um, okay. at the moment. Uh, okay. And I'm not like, I am looking, but I'm also not looking because I'm like, okay, this is my schedule for the summer, right? And there's like a billion things I need to do. Right. Uh, um. So yeah, ideally, if the right person comes along, I'm sure you know I'll be open to it. Uh, okay, what would that right person be? What would it be? I mean, what's I mean? Let's just give people some parameters here. <laughs> like, do they have to be, you know, this or that, or? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, they will have to be uh, male or female. Okay, so you can either, either side of the street. Okay. I, I play for both teams. Um, okay. They would ideally um, be Jewish. But it doesn't. It's not a prerequisite, though. Okay. Uh, so if they are Jewish, it's a plus. It's okay. a plus for my mom, but also for me. Okay. Uh, I'm not practicing. Like I'm not religious, but I celebrate the holidays and I, okay. I like honoring my Jewish tradition. Okay, um, but you do believe in some kind of cosmic consciousness, right? Uh, yeah, I believe in Q. <laughs> Q. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't believe things. I think things. Things happen for a reason. Okay. I don't, I, I, I think there's like spirit, you know, I believe that there's like a spiritual world somehow, like there is mm -hmm. something. I mm -hmm. wouldn't say it's a God. I don't know if it's a God. I mean, maybe it's a God. Uh, well, that's a whole other subject because when people say that God is this, God is that, nobody knows what God is. God is like your fantasy of what you think God is, but like. I, I believe, <laughs> well, well. Uh, <laughs> is god for me. yeah uh but also uh yeah i don't know it's a it's a it's a good um yeah i i don't i'm not sure uh, okay so they have to be uh they can be so all, so far all they have to be either a male or a female 
Uh, could they be non-binary too? Actually, Is that possible? Yeah, they, they could be non-binary. I, it, it did not okay. happen to me yet that I was in, in that kind of a relationship, but um, okay. sure. Really and can. hopefully Jewish. Jewish is a plus. Jewish is a plus. Okay. Um, filmmaking is a plus. Filmmaking? Um, Dutch is a plus. Dutch? Yes, Dutch. Netherlands. I had a girlfriend who was Dutch. Ooh. She spoke Dutch and Russian, surprisingly. Wow. She got a PhD in chemistry. Now she lives in Portugal. We're still Facebook friends after all these years. That sounds good. Actually. Yeah. She plays violin. Oh. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Dutch. Um, uh, do they need to speak? How many languages do they need to be fluent at? Well, they can just speak English, but if they speak Hebrew, that's a plus. If they speak uh, Dutch, that's a plus too. Can you, uh, can you understand ancient Hebrew? Uh, well, that depends what you define agent. Like, in other words, if you looked at something in the Torah or, or what I call the Old oh, Testament, yeah. can you read the, the original yeah. Hebrew and understand it? Yeah, the original Hebrew is, is very close to what we talk today in, in modern Israel. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, based on For some the same reason, I thought there was different. I can, I can open the Torah and read, yes. Um, it will not be the same, you know, it's, it's like kind of old English, you know, like Shakespeare. Okay, we're supposed to end this, but I'm going to ask one other question, which could go for another four hours so what's your interpretation of the word elohim <laughs> well elohim that's god uh in hebrew so but what i heard is it actually means if you literally translate it, it means the strong ones plural i don't see how elohim yeah i don't, I don't know how that would uh I mean, it could be read as a plural world, but I don't know what "elo" he would mean. Uh, okay. So. Okay. Or that's a that's a subject of another interview. Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the, the the literal, uh, you know, the literal translation would, would be God. Right. I know that's what I mean. That's how it translates in your typical it be, Bible. Right. It would be plural God for, for yeah. Reason. It's it's written in plural in Hebrew, but it, it does refer to one God. Um, cause, cause Jewish is, you know, just, just one monotheistic, God. but see, from my point of view, that's a bit of a, a little fudge factor that was put in after the fact. Uh, so at some point way back when, from my point of view, which I kind of try to take a archeological scientific view is that at some point that scripture was talking about God's plural. And yeah. then later the monotheistic version of it was kind of superimposed over it now i'll get a bunch of bad comments and possibly i kind of like throw arrows at this video now <laughs> sorry guys i right. i, I <laughs> must say it's not uh on uh, it's it, it is very possible it, it is possible i never thought about it see yeah this is a very thought-provoking conversation <laughs> well okay yeah so you now you really got to go because you told them 7 30 now it's quarter to eight well i asked for 10 more minutes but yes I. oh we get to go to eight now no, no, no. I asked at 7.30. I asked for 10 Okay. Hours. All right. Let's wrap it up. You know me. I'm just going to keep asking questions, and each one will spawn another hour worth of talking. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm definitely enjoying this, but I, I okay. wrap you up. You got to go. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we could do a follow-up probably after the summer because the summer is going to be insane. Sounds great. Um, okay. Well, and then so if I meet a nice human being that – I, you know, my, <laughs> you want like a girl like you, <laughs> I'll put in a good word for you. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. I mean, by all means, I, I, I am. You have such a great camera presence too. I mean, so, I mean, okay, let's gush for one more second. So you just, I mean, you're just so beautiful and you just look, I mean, you just keep glowing all this positive. Is it, is that just what happens when the camera gets turned on or is this how you always no, are? that's how I offer it. I mean, that's the only way you can make music, right? Um, yeah. You just like, in other words, if you look at it from a point of view of yoga or meditation from internet shirt yoga, I would say that your heart chakra is very much open oh yeah it is i am very open to it yeah so your heart is open um, all yeah. this love is coming out yeah. constantly the and creativity is, yes. the, and the, the, courage yeah. and confidence all those things are coming out of open-hearted yeah. person the problem, right? is, the problem is my life is so colorful and adventure like and exciting like things that uh -huh. are exciting happen all the time right i work on i work on star trek like this is exciting right. i just did another huge 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 project that i right. can't talk about yet but 
it's exciting stuff. And NDA. Yeah, it's there is actually I never signed an NDA, but this is like a this is like a respect thing. I will not talk about it. Cross your heart. Um, you know, but what my point is like my my life is on a very high speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I'll I'll end up doing revision until two a.m. or something, and mm-hmm. so I put my career at first. Um, right. and that's that is uh, you know a bit of an issue for you know finding a partner. Romance. By, you know, like how are they going to keep up with you? Exactly. So in, yeah. a, in terms of like you know my time and availability, and the other thing is like a person that will be as exciting, you know. Because mm-hmm. I will get bored. I, I have gotten bored before, you know. Yeah, like, so I think probably the person that you would need would be somebody that's similarly creative. Yeah, crazy. So yeah. so that you could just sit there and free associate yeah. and bounce off with each other. Well, if you find yeah. someone like that, uh, hit me up. and. Uh... <laughs> yeah, and but then, of course, there is the time thing. I mean, you know, you're already full. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, after the summer, I'll be less. Yeah. Do you think you're at some point you're, I mean, right now you're totally in high gear because you're just hit this new start, newfound stardom. So do you think you, you'll slow it down a bit after a while or is it still going to just be going um, crazy like no. this? Uh, yes and no. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I, I still don't have like a big team or anything. I don't have an assistant. Um, okay. So with that, uh, you know, at my level, I think I do need an assistant, yeah. um, but I like doing things and I, I actually also enjoy the technical parts. Uh, so mm-hmm. uh, it gives me a moment out of out of being creative. I just can just focus on like, you know, something less creative for, you know, for five minutes, for 10 minutes, for for half yeah. an hour. Um, so I actually enjoyed those breaks. Um, but yeah, I mean, say if I took all the technical aspects and gave them to some someone else, then that would create more time. So eventually I will have to do that because technically you okay. can't do everything. All do you ever time. find yourself overwhelmed or like sudden you're like, oh my God, I committed to so much stuff. I'm not going to, I'm going to just, and then oh, yeah. suddenly fall apart for like two yeah, this seconds. Morning, <laughs> this morning I was like, oh shit, I've signed up to too many things. Okay. Um, but now I'm like, no, I'll, I'll get them done. It'll be fine. You know, I, I, there, there has never been a project I didn't deliver. So I'm mm-hmm. definitely- you know, I'm confident that everything will, will work out. Um, I, you know, I think that everything, again, this goes back to confidence, but like everything that I worked on prepared me for challenges. And mm-hmm. the moment I take a challenge, okay, Uh-oh. uh, yeah. you got dinged. And the moment I take a challenge, I'm like, I know I'm ready for it. Otherwise it wouldn't appear in front of me, you know, cause right. I think for a reason. So there you go. It wraps up all the questions together. There we go. We got it. But we need to keep it keep it slightly open ended so that we can do another interview in yes. a couple months. Oh yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, and let me okay. Hear, uh, you have a recording of your uh, of the of the cello. Um, yeah, it's uh, right now. I'm working. On, I'll send it to you. I have to edit it because I mean it was good for a live performance, but there were a lot of things messed up in the orchestra, and also I made up some stupid mistakes too in <laughs> my own piece. Okay. And uh, but all of it, I I'm I can I know I'm going to be able to fix using various fancy editing techniques. So finally, when I have it in good shape, I'll send you. I'll send okay. it to you. Yeah, I'd love yeah. to hear. All right. Cool. All right. Take care. Wait. Got to do live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Oh, yeah, I sound like Spock. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper, dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta change.